Okay then, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is building on what we, what we chatted about or what we, we may not have chatted about uh, a little while ago. So the first thing I would like to do is I would like to just make sure that we generally remember the, the core concepts of, of what we discussed earlier, if you like, and then we'll, we'll move into it. We said that the, the governments of the world generally want to measure three things, if you like, yeah? So therefore their targets are three things. Now that target changes every now and again. So what are the measures and targets? What are the three things that we, as a government, we want to do well, if you like? Do, do we remember? And again, feel free just to... Employment. employment, yeah? So therefore, we measure employment, yeah? So therefore, we want our unemployment rate to be a certain level, yeah? And the new guy at the Bank of England as well as uh, the guy who was just about to leave in America, kind of moved the focus onto, away from one of these other measures, onto this measure as a forward guidance to the market. This is what we, this is what we want to do, and we'll kind of chat about what they are. Brilliant, what else? Inflation, tremendous. This used to be our main target, and if you look at any of the, the websites, it kind of still is our main target. So inflation, movement upwards in prices there are many inflation measures we kind of looked at the cpi yeah the cpi the consumer purchasing index which is what the what what they mainly look at if you like the governments of the world and the last one GDP, so growth, yeah? So therefore, we want our countries to grow and we measure that growth with GDP. So therefore, what we've got is in the macro climate, the governments of the world want these three things to be all right, yeah? Now, they've got what their measure of all right is, but that's it. So the other thing we chatted about was what tools do we have at our disposal, yeah? So therefore... There is the stuff that Mark Carney is in charge of. What, did we, what, did, what policy was that, anybody? Begins with M? Monetary. monetary policy, yeah. So therefore, when you look at monetary policy, that is kind of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. He can do that. And that rears its head in the form of interest rates. And in the wonderful world that we are in at the minute, the asset purchase world, the quantitative easing, yeah? So therefore, monetary policy, they can mess around with interest rates, potentially, they can mess around with uh, this thing called quantitative easing, which, again, is probably the key topic on, on lots of countries in the developed world's mind at the moment. And then on the other side, what policy is Mr. Osborne in charge of? Begins with F. Fiscal. Fiscal. Perfect, yeah, so that's your fiscal policy, and that's all about kind of tax and government spending, yeah? So in a, in around about 30 seconds, we've chatted about what we, what we might have taken an hour and a bit in the, the last week, but that's, or the last time we met. So these are the three measures. These are the tools that we've got to use, yeah? So therefore, these tools should be in tandem in order to make sure that these things are doing what we want. Now, as I said, historically, we wanted inflation to be around about 2%, and that was our key aim. And if you look at the Eurozone, they still basically talk in their, in their literature, around about 2% is it. But what we have done in the UK is we've moved our target more to this. Yeah. So therefore, we want unemployment to be less than what, or what are we, what are we saying? 7%, exactly, brilliant, yeah? So America is 6.5%, because they obviously want to be better than us. Ours is 7%, yeah? So therefore, that's our new target. So what has changed is these guys here have decided that it's best if the city, the world, industry know what our aims are. So the new term for that is forward guidance. Yeah, I've got to admit, I'm unsure whether it is anything that's massively new, but we're pushing it. So forward guidance is where you are not really going to get any surprises from the monetary guys. We are telling you that if this happens, and only when this happens, we will then think of doing something else. Yeah? Open brackets. 
unless something really weird happens, close brackets. Yeah, there's always that caveat. Yeah, this is what we think is going to happen. This is what we're aiming for. But if it all goes horribly wrong, then we probably will will do something else. Yeah. So that's what they're doing both in the states and here. We're moving towards this. No surprises from these people. And then when we look at the tools, interest rates in the UK are at half a percent. And I think it was just before my chat, I said half a percent. What's the point in dropping rates to quarter of a percent? Madness. And I think probably the words were just coming out of my mouth as the Eurozone dropped it from half a percent to quarter of a percent. Yeah. So therefore, I am obviously not saying that the Europeans are mad, but that's, that's what you've got. Yeah. We don't have a lot of room for manoeuvre here to encourage this. Yeah. Which is why you are in the wonderful world of the quantitative easing, which we're going to kind of chat about. And on the fiscal side, we had the autumn statement from Mr. Osborne. And again, bless him, he doesn't really have a huge amount to play with. Yeah. So therefore, we are, again, you probably, we're kind of up to here with debt. And uh, some northern comedian wishes he was a bit taller, so we could be up there. Yeah, so we are, we've got an awful lot of debt. So therefore, what can he do? The autumn statement, he said, was fiscally neutral, if you like. So therefore, if he was going to be spending money, he was going to be saving it. Yeah, so that's what we've got. And we'll kind of chat about, about that. So this is our situation in the UK. I picked a random point in time about two years ago and look at now because what we want to see is are we moving in the right direction, yeah? So that it, and again, it just gives us a kind of a guide. So inflation, we know that inflation, it, we would like it to be around about 2%, give or take, yeah? And early 2012, about January 2012, it was running at four and a bit percent. The, the Bank of England was saying, look, it's kind of outside of our control. The other two things are more important anyway. And we think it will kind of work its way through. Yeah. So the reason inflation was high was because commodity prices were high. We got all of these other things flowing through. So therefore, that 2.1 percent is nice. It's around about where, where we want to be. The big problem is, I don't, know, I, I, can't, I don't know if it actually got any press this, so you might not be aware of it, but the electricity companies have put their prices up. I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're aware of that. It got, might have slipped under the radar. That's not in this inflation number, yeah? So therefore, the next inflation number is probably going to be a little higher, yeah? Because that's when that will feed through. Now, the... The, the, the problem that the government and everybody's got at the minute is whenever they're looking at numbers now and they're looking at it against last year, then during the summer when we were looking at our numbers against last year, we had the Olympics. Yeah, so therefore the Olympics, it was hard, that was troublesome. This year, none of you would have been here because we were all snowed in, if you like, last year, sorry, this time. So when we're comparing, does it, so that's, the, that's what you've got. So month on month, we're kind of all right in 2013. But looking back to 2012, there was a lot of weird things going on, impacting on the numbers. And then if we compare, it's kind of difficult. But even if we get the electricity prices or whatever, then inflation is not, not in, a, not in a, a, a bad place. Yeah, everybody? And then we look at GDP. And again, this is annual growth. And what they mean by annual growth is, what was the GDP in the quarter that we measured relative to the same quarter last year? Yeah, so therefore, how much are we making in up to September in 2013? How much are we making in 2012? So we were growing a little bit in 2012. We are growing a little more now. Yeah, so therefore, we are moving towards where we would like to be. Yes, everybody comfortable with that? Now, the issues around this are going to be, and it's kind of bizarre, can we continue to grow because of spare capacity? So therefore, do we, as a nation, have enough room in our factories to grow? Yeah, because what we did during the, the bad times is we cut a lot of things back. We laid a lot of people off. A lot of our units went unlet. So therefore, they're saying our spare capacity, if you like, is around about 1.5%. Now, how quickly can we ramp that up is something that we, we've kind of got to think about, if you like. Yeah? So in order to grow, we have got two things that need to happen. 
Number one, people have got to be interested in buying stuff. And number two, we've got to be able to make the stuff. Yeah, so everybody cool with that? So therefore, are we going to be able to make it at the rate that we want to make it? Now, obviously, spare capacity as far as the world that we're in is people who are able to do the job. Yeah, if I am making stuff, then I need a machine to make it. Yeah, I know you're all in awe at my technical ability there. Yeah, but if we've got a machine to make it, but here in the service sector, it's kind of people like us. That's what, that's where our, our can we step in and do it. And the other one is the demand. And the main people who drive it are ourselves. Yeah, so retailers. That's you and I. We're spending a bit more, but the problem is that there is a worry that we cannot continue to spend at the same, or continue to grow because, and this, <laughs> our salaries aren't growing at that rate, yeah? Does it, so we're spending, the, the rate at which we're spending more is higher than our wages are going up, yeah? Does everybody see that which is, is difficult to sustain <laughs> for obvious reasons? So therefore, but the thing about it is, if our wages start to go up, then you might start worrying about this, yeah? So therefore, that if we need to be paid, and I'm, not, it, I'm just saying this in a very neutral way, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but if you've got to pay the staff more, then your goods might go up, and then the inflation, yeah, does everybody? So that's what people call cost push inflation, i.e. the costs of making stuff push up the price. And then unemployment is working its way down, and we've said that our... 7% is what our aim is. So we are moving very, very slowly but surely towards that. And that's where the estimates are. Everybody's kind of focusing on when will we hit this 7%. Yeah? So some people are saying it's going to be early 2015. Some people are saying it's going to be late 2014. Now, the reason the market is focusing on this is because that's when the tools that we use to manage the economy are going to start thinking about changing. Yeah? So that's why everybody's focusing on that. At that point in time, we may start, and we're going to talk about this unwinding quantitative easing. Then we might start putting interest rates up. Then we might start. Yeah? So that's where a lot of the, the analysis is going to. Rates, being a member of the Monetary Policy Committee for the last three years or so, has probably been really dull. Shall we keep rates the same? Yeah, go on, then have we got any choice? No. And they look back in years gone by when there's been split votes and one person wanted to put it up quarter of a percent. They want to put it down here. Kind of every, all right then. So I, I think they just do it virtually now. They phone up, is it, but shall I turn up? Nah, don't worry about it. We're just going to leave it the same anyway. But what they have done over the last couple of years is this bit, quantitative easing. And this... Again, we can, this is something that we didn't discuss massively in the first one. We can talk a bit more about what it is and how it works. But if we just look at the numbers, quantitative easing, we have, the government has bought assets worth $275 billion. Yeah? So the way in this, this kind of thing works is you've got the government, you've got fidelity, if you like, or some asset manager, and what the government does is they give them cash and they buy off them government bonds. Yeah? So therefore they give the cash to Fidelity. Fidelity gets the cash. They give the government bonds to the government. So in a way the government is swapping cash for their own debt. And then the hope is that Fidelity then has this cash. And unless Fidelity thinks that this cash is the same type of asset as owning a government bond, then they will look to invest it. And this is the key thing. So Fidelity then has got this money, and what Fidelity then hopefully does is either buy shares, or corporate bonds, or whatever else. Yeah? And if they're buying shares or corporate bonds, then they may be new shares, they may be new corporate bonds. So therefore that's investment going into the system. If they're existing corporate bonds or existing shares, then it's pushing the price up a little bit. Yeah? Does everybody see that? So that's, the, the, that's what we've got. And as a byproduct, what should also happen is that as a bank, I am going to be getting more deposits. Yeah? So what I can then hopefully do with those deposits is lend them out. 
and this is where it kind of hasn't happened in a way that they thought it might. All right. The problem is the people who they want to lend them to lend to are the small to medium sized enterprises. Yeah. Small to medium sized enterprises are risky. If I lend money to risky people, then the new capital adequacy system that the regulators have put in place means I've got to set aside a lot of money to do that. A lot of capital, sorry, money is the wrong word, a lot of capital. Which means that my shareholders don't get the return that they would like. Yeah, does it? So therefore there is a little confusion in what we've got. Now that's, does everybody see? So what I'm doing is I am buying bonds. That money is then reinvested. It may end up in a bank account and it may end up getting loaned out. This bit here is the bit where we are less comfortable. It's actually happening. The rest of it is happening, but that is the bit that's. So that, that, to be perfectly honest, that is a very strange thing, but they didn't have any choice. Yeah? They had to stimulate the economy. In their mind, they didn't have any choice. They had to stimulate the economy, and they couldn't reduce interest rates to make everybody think, ooh, money's cheap. Let's do stuff. So this was it. Any, any questions on that? Because that, that is probably the, the weirdest thing we're going to talk about this morning. If it's kind of like the Royal Mail or whatever else, then I would, were they existing shares? Probably yes. But if it's new shares, so if it's someone like Barclays doing a rights issue, they are raising money to do more business. So therefore, what you're doing is you're investing in companies. Yeah? So if it's new shares, I'm investing in companies. If it's new bonds, then I'm either helping companies refinance or I'm investing in them. But if they are buying the shares, if Fidelity are buying the shares from Aviva or whatever, then does everybody say the company doesn't get that money? It is just that demand for those shares go up and the price will rise. So if you look at the Standard & Poor's 100, the FTSE 100, all of the share indices, they are relatively high, and that it may be partly, he says maybe, trying to be the politician, that may be partly due to this. There's a lot of money lying around and I've got to put it somewhere. And therefore, that's the, that will force those asset prices up. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We'll have a little chat about but that. So the hope is part of it, or a reasonable amount of it, is going to be going to businesses to help them grow. And if they then buy new machines, buy new factories, employ more people, we start to do whatever we do. Yeah? We start to sort of hit the three, three targets that we're, we're kind of looking for. Money is a, is, a, is a weird thing. It's a fickle. And they measure it in, there's M0, there's M4, <laughs> there's the joke, M25 or whatever. But there's M, there's M everything. So generally what you've got is there are notes and coins. So those are the things that they print or they, I don't know what you do with a coin. You don't print it. I don't know. Anyway. So those are the things that they produce. And then what you've got is you have got the what you might call the, the total money supply. And this is where if I go to somebody, so therefore if the government prints a hundred pounds and then gives it to an individual, yeah, they then deposit that in a bank. Now what the bank can then do is the bank may have to keep 10% of that in its in its tills, if you like, just in case this person wants to, to go out on a night. But the other 90 pounds, it can then lend to other individuals. Yeah? So therefore, they lend 90 pounds to somebody else. So do you see that from the 100 pound that is printed, we've got 190 pounds out there because the, the money that they loan to the person who's got the 90 pounds, they then buy a car that then gets deposited, yeah. and then the 90 pounds that then gets deposited, that bank keeps 10% of it to one side and lends out. So this is the money multiplier or whatever. Yeah. We don't even have to do that. We just go into, we go into this, 
we go into this little thing on our computer and we add a couple of notes. Yeah, we don't even have to go ching ching ching. We just that's it. That's money has been created, if you like. And that's all because the total money supply in the, 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 the broader measure is nothing to do with the notes and coins. It's just our wealth. And it's back to this thing that if everybody went to the bank and asked for their money, it ain't there. That's just the way the system works. But you're right. So we call it printing money. And I think it's great. I think it's a really because it's easier to understand than somebody goes to a computer and just adds another couple of notes. And those are the, that's the money that's kind of flying around. OK? Now, what has happened with this is that the balance sheet of the Bank of England, i.e. the number of assets and liabilities, that, this, that has grown immeasurably. Yeah? That's where there's a lot of this money that's been is in the Fed's balance sheet and in this balance sheet. So that's it. But effectively, what they have done is they have made more of this money available. So they haven't necessarily printed it. There is just more of the broader term that we call money. Definitely, in a good way, if you want to grow, because the currency becomes cheaper, yeah. and therefore our exports are cheaper. Yeah. The people who are upset are the people who need an apple, because, i.e., not the fruit, yeah. but this newfangled machine, because at that point I've got to pay for that using dollars. My pounds are not worth as much, so that becomes more expensive to me. Yeah? So imports become more expensive, exports become cheaper. And if I'm trying to grow, that may be considered a positive thing. Yeah? yeah? But I then have to look at inflation because it's going to have an upward pull on inflation because if the basket of goods is primarily import, then inflation is going to go up. So you're spot on. And this is the problem we've got. Their argument was that the problems we've just discussed are kind of a tea stain on the carpet the problem I'm trying to solve is my house is on fire. Yeah? So therefore, there are, there are different problems, and that's what their view was. Whether they're right or wrong, we'll find out in years to come. But, that's the, but, that's, that's, but you're right, there are problems, and that's what we're going to have a look at with doing what, what they have done. How come the inflation hasn't gone up? That is because in order, so therefore, inflation can go up in the simple word, it can either be cost push or demand pull. So cost push is the inputs into making the goods become more expensive. People have to put their price up. Nobody's getting a wage rise in the developed economies, if you like. So therefore, we're not really pushing the prices up that way. Commodity prices are falling. In gen I mean, they're volatile, but they're lower than they were historically. So all of that is having a downward pull on the inflation. And on the demand side, this is the side that in the future they are worried about, I would argue. If there's too much money sloshing around the system, then people will start to chase things and the price will get pulled up. And that's the, but that hasn't happened yet. We haven't had our pay rises. The growth is there, but it's anything but soft. Yeah? There is a lot of things that could derail us at the minute. And I think that's, that's what you've got. So we, we haven't got the confidence to go out and buy seven Apple computers or whatever. We're buying a little bit more, but it's still on the... And I think our net saving rate is still... We, it dropped a little bit. I think it's going back up again. I think people are getting ready just in case something kind of bad happens. Yeah? But the problem we've got is that's what's happening now. We are worried about what happens next year, the year after. And one of the issues with this is potential inflation, which is why we've got to manage. We've given everybody the chocolate. We've got to take the chocolate off them at some point. And how do, how do they react at that point? Brilliant. That OK? So looking at that, that's quantitative easing. So they put another 100 billion in, yeah, in the, the two years. That was in 2012. They haven't done anything in 2013. So they figured the economy wasn't doing that brilliantly in 2012. It needed more of an impetus. It needed more help. 
so therefore they helped it. This year, we haven't helped it any more, but we've just left it the same. Yeah? And then you've got how much debt have we got? So the UK's debt to its output is around about 90%. Yeah? Before the crash, it was about 40%. So that's the headache that we have. At some point, we are going to have to get this back down to a manageable amount. Well, that is our bonds. So as far as the person who, have, who has bought the bonds, they are un, unsecured. So the majority of that is the government issuing debt instruments, if you like. So for the person holding it, it's unsecured. But we're different as because it's a government. And even though they've got this level of debt, they own the photocopier. So they can give you the money back. As we've said, all I've got to do is add a couple of notes and say, there you are. You look in your bank account, whoa, I've given you your money back. That's fine. But the problem with that is, if I do that, is how much is that money worth? So inflation is the, is the fundamental thing. Uh, and this is the bit that, that some people kind of got, got confused about. The deficit, this is basically how much we are our debt is growing by. So when you're looking at debt, there are two things. How much debt have I got? And is that debt going up or down? Yeah? So, and it is, it's a, it's a nice announcement, it's a pleasant announcement, but it's got to be, in a way, put into perspective. The announcement is generally that our deficit is reducing. And I don't think a lot of people are fully aware of what the word deficit means at that point. That means our debt is increasing slower than it was in the past, yeah? That's what deficit reduction means. That means I'm still creating more debt, but I am creating more debt at a slower pace, yeah? 2018, 2019, if our predictions are reasonable, at that point we will have around about a balanced budget. What that means is we will be spending what we are collecting. So whatever we collect in taxes and everything else, we will spend on hospitals. That will be balanced. If not, we will have collected a little bit more in than we paid out. Yeah? So we believe that our debt burden is going to peak 2016, 2017. And then it will start to hopefully drop away. But... In order to pay the debt back, we need to make more stuff. We need the GDP to grow because that means more people are paying taxes, etc. So therefore, all of these are down to our predictions. Yeah? What we don't need is somewhere like France to say, well, actually, things are worse than we thought they were. At that point, everything just... And I picked France just randomly <coughs> rather than a nation who may do it. But that's the, that's the issue you've got. Yeah? Does everybody see that? That's, that's the problem we have, if you like. So our debt is growing at a slower rate. That is partly due to the fiscal measures, i.e. the government is focused on austerity, as they call it, and partly due to the fact that the economy is in a bit of a better place. Yeah, the two things kind of go hand in hand. Okay? Surplus. Sorry, surplus, yeah. And the reason you wouldn't know it because we haven't had one for ages. Yeah? It's called a dream, I believe. Or, or fiction is another term you could, you could have. And most of the surpluses we've seen in the last 10 years have always been two years away. I kind of feel like it's me talking to my daughter. Can I have a phone? Yeah, in two years' time. Fortunately, her math is getting better, so she's working out that. So when is two years' time? Well, it's always two years, yeah? From here. From today, it is two years. Next year, when it'll, it'll be two years from then. And that's my slight concern with these types of numbers. We're always going to be better off then than we are now. Gordon Brown was the chancellor. I, I'm not saying it was his fault, or his, but that it was then. And we, we started paying off our, our longer-term debt at that point. Probably when we had oil, generally speaking, would be the... I'm not saying it's anything to do with... 
that wasn't the mention of Gordon Brown. That's maybe you know, it might have been. So uh, it was back then. I mean, it was a, it was a long, long time ago. So. Okay, everybody, cool with that. So that's our situation. And the fundamentals is that the fundamentals are sorry that's bad. Yeah, to use a technical term, we've got to. So therefore, from a fiscal perspective, your hands are tied because we have got a shared load of debt. Yeah, so I can't really do a lot fiscally. Uh, and from a monetary perspective, interest rates, I know I said, we, there's not a huge amount. This is the reason why that this is here to stimulate growth, to make people feel better about life. So, if we look at the impact of this quantitative easing, we've mentioned, mentioned a couple of things. Higher asset prices, yeah, so therefore this is because the people have more cash to buy bonds and equities, yeah, everybody cool with that? So therefore going back to that little fidelity diagram, I've given fidelity the money, they then take that money, they buy shares and bonds. So what we've had is the FTSE 100, which is our share index, is relatively high against if we didn't have quantitative easing, is the view, yeah? Bond prices are higher than if we didn't have quantitative easing. And the key point to this, by the way, is the interest rates. So because we push bond prices up, that means debt is cheaper, yeah? So your long-term debt is cheaper. And this is the thing that everybody, that's the first thing to change when we think the government policy is going to change. So 20-year debt, kind of 2% or whatever. But once we start unwinding, this is going to go up. And that will have an impact on corporates. That will have an impact on households. Yeah, does everybody see that? So therefore, that's one. So what you've got is you have got the, if I am a corporate and I want 20 year debt, yeah, then the way the market works it out is what is the return that 20 year government debt gives plus a bit for the, for the credit risk, i.e. the fact that you might not pay me. Yeah, is everybody cool with that? That's generally how we work it out. So what quantitative easing is doing is it is buying 20-year government debt and what that does is that pushes up the price yeah now with government debt the 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 interest that they pay the coupon that they pay is constant yeah they you get the same return cash wise so if the price goes up then what that does is it reduces the return or the yield yeah so by pushing, and it's purely supply and demand. There are more people buying these things. The supply hasn't increased, so the price goes up. Therefore, the return I get on the bond goes down, and that feeds directly into that. So therefore, because that is lower, the 20-year corporate debt is lower. That, that's, the, that's what you, from the 20, and that will be throughout the time periods, if you like. That's, so debt is cheaper because of this. Debt is also cheaper because there's more money about, if you like, yeah? So we've increased the amount of money that's about, so it's easier for banks or whoever to get hold of it. There's another, another side of it. Policy signaling, this is basically saying that <laughs> the key thing is before I increase interest rates, I am going to have to wind down QE. Yeah, so everybody, so therefore what the government is saying is we haven't started to wind down quantitative easing yet. We are still keeping this money in the economy. We are fully behind <coughs> growth. We are going to continue to do this until our growth is secure. So therefore, in the marketplace, you should accept this and you should make your decisions based upon this. Yeah, that's what the signaling message is. Some of the markets say, yeah, whatever. 
some of the markets might kind of, but that's what it is. It's saying growth is our core focus. And this is just to make sure that you know it's our core focus. Once we start unwinding QE, then the market is being given a signal that we are in a good place and we're going to start changing our monetary policy because the marketplace doesn't need the injections that we're giving it. Yeah? America mentioned it halfway through this year. The market spat their dummy out and acted in a very petulant manner, which is normal for the markets. And then they had to wind their, they had to come back, if you like. But that's the signaling side of things. In improving liquidity, the government, if you think about it in the bond markets, the government is going out and buying bonds. So therefore, there's more of this stuff. There's more trading going on because we're putting money in. That money is being used to buy and sell stuff. So therefore, if people want to raise new money in either the equity or the bond market, there's more money out there. Yeah, so the improving liquidity, there's just more money out there. Yeah? Now, the big question is, is it working? The short answer to that question, by the way, is I haven't got a clue. Yeah? So therefore, that's the, 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 the fundamental answer to that question. But is it working? I would say that what, you, what the government states is that basically, and I've, I've just written it down from, the, from this government report that came in, they say that most people in the UK are better off because of it. Yeah? And remember, this is all relative. So this is all relative to what we would have been without it. Yeah? The sad thing is, on this one, unless you happen to be a member of it, and maybe, maybe you are, the top 5% are the ones that are the best off. Yeah? Because if you think about it, the top 5% hold most of the equity, relatively speaking, hold most of the debt. And as these things are getting bought, what's happening to the prices? They're going up. Yeah? So therefore, everybody's better off, but they do not dispute that the better off are even better off. Yeah? If that's good grammar. Yeah? So, so that's, that's fine. Would they have preferred that not to happen? Possibly. But it's kind of, it, it comes with the territory. It's very, very difficult not to, not to do that. They argue that unemployment is a lot lower than it would have been due to the fact that people at least have had an element of funding. They've had stuff that they, they want that they, can, that they can invest in. They are saying that growth is higher due to this. Yeah, so we've come out of it. And if you look at Japan, Japan kind of didn't do this and everybody was worried about the lost decades, the lost whatever, so we, we're trying to trying to avert that crisis. And the last but not least, they are saying that more companies survived due to this. Yeah, so there were less bankruptcies, etc. Yeah. Now, there are people who are saying that even if this may be true, when we wean ourselves off this, how, how is it going to be? Is, it, is, is the is the pain of coming down from this high going to be worth what we've had? And the short answer to that is we haven't got a clue, yeah, because we've never done this. We have never unwound QE. This is the first time we've done it, so therefore this is the first time we're going to be unwinding it. So we don't know. Now they're going to start taking it back, yeah. So therefore, what the government will do is it will sell the bond. I mean, there are a number of ways you can do it. You could unwind it in the long run just by whenever a bond comes to maturity and that money is paid back, I just don't reinvest that money. So that would take us, because a lot of the debt they bought was longer term, that would take us a while. But I think unwinding could be I take the bonds that I, the government, own and I sell them back into the marketplace, take the cash back out by selling them. So that's unwinding, getting, me, getting my, the government's balance sheet back to where it was, government, the Bank of England's balance back to where it was. So it could be selling bonds back in. Yeah? So, therefore when, so therefore when the bond matures, 
weirdly, the government pays the Bank of England the money for the bond, and then it just stays in there. It doesn't go back out again. Yeah? Because at the minute, if we look at that, so what the government has got is, the government's got a bond, or the Bank of England's got a bond. I'm kind of, so what will happen is, the, if that bond matures now, then in effect, the government pays itself, that, that asset is now coming out of the market, but then the government doesn't put that cash back in. Yeah, it doesn't recycle that. No, if with a government bond it doesn't kind of work, you pay me the interest and then you give me everything back at the end. They call it a bullet bond. So it's not like our mortgage. Well, you can. You used to be able to. So there are repayment mortgages and there are interest only mortgages. A government bond is an interest only one rather than a repayment. The lost decades. They had deflation. They've had, their economy has just bobbed along for 20 years. Yeah, they're still the fourth biggest economy on the planet, but they have bobbed quite a bit. So therefore, they've suffered from deflation. They haven't had growth. They have had uh, kind of just their, their people weren't buying things because they knew if they waited until next week, they'd be cheaper than if they bought them now. So the whole thing, it's just your economy slows down. And that's what they, they've lost 20 years worth of growth, potentially. Yeah. And we don't want that, apparently. Yeah. The negative side of this, by the way, is if you've got any cash, it's earning you nothing. Yeah. So therefore, that is partly due to, because in this report, they said it's nothing to do with QE. I, I, I've got to admit, they are very clever individuals and they've got names after their, they've got letters after their name this long. But I still can't, you can't, I don't, I don't fully agree with that. Now, our interest rates that we get paid in our deposit accounts, partly driven by the half a percent set by the government, not by the, the, the Bank of England who's doing the QE, but it's also partly due to how much money is out there. The amount of money that a bank pays you on your deposit is driven by how desperate they are for your money. And if they can get money from lots of other places very, very cheaply, they don't have to give us interest. Yeah, does everybody, and that's the situation. The increased liquidity means that a lot of banks can just get their money from wherever. So I would say that your savers, if you like, and the people who are just about to move into their pension, I think they've been hit by these low interest rates. Okay, yeah, everybody. So, let this, I introduced this uh, towards the end of the last one. We didn't spend a huge amount of time on it, but, but we introduced it. This is all of the things that impact on what we're doing. And we can see the effect of all of the, the government's actions on these things. So, if we look at asset prices, and we look at, in the UK, our favorite asset, our house, yeah? Our, it's our favorite asset if we've got one. If we haven't got one, we hate them, yeah? <laughs> but that's what we've got, yeah? So the, this, is, this is something that is fairly UK-centric. We, we like owning our homes. So what's happened to house prices over the last year? They've shot up, yeah? So therefore, I think in the paper yesterday, it was on average 5.5%, yeah, across the UK. Where do you think's got the highest? If you had to have a wild stab in the dark, London. London's grown at 12%, yeah? So the UK has grown at 5.5%, London's grown at 12%. So if you own a property, then happy days. I am now slightly wealthier than I was before. If, I, if you own a property in Chelsea, you're now a lot wealthier than you were before. But, but that's what you've got, yeah? So therefore, house prices are growing. As far as that's concerned, does that make people happy or sad? If you own a house. Happy. happy. So you may be willing to spend a bit more, yeah? So if you spend a bit more, then there's retail set, yeah? Is everybody? Now, the government tried to help with this. Bless them, yeah? So therefore, what they did was they brought out a number of different schemes. There's funding for lending. And funding for lending is where 
if you're a bank and you, are, you want money to lend to small businesses or lend to people buying a house, the government will give you it cheaply. Yeah? So they will give you it for 1%. You lend it out at 3%, you're making money. Yeah, does everybody see? So funding for lending. That's one of the schemes that had an impact on house prices. And there was also the help to buy. Yeah? So the help to buy was where people who didn't have a deposit, the government kind of helped them get on the ladder. Yeah? Is everybody cool with that? So both of these things were driving demand. So what they were doing is they were trying to increase demand for houses. Now, again, I am aware that I am not a doctor or whatever else, or have the, but if you increase demand without increasing supply, anybody want to have a wild stab as to what might happen to prices of stuff? Yeah, they generally are going. And I think that's the problem we've got. And I love the fact that the government has now said, well, actually, this help to buy thing, or this, sorry, this, this funding for lending for mortgages, we're not really sure that we should be doing this. What we'll do is we'll get the Bank of England. So they've passed it on to the Bank of England and said, look, if there is a bubble being created, then stop this. Yeah, so therefore Mark Carney thought, brilliant, I'm glad I moved from Canada for this. He then has to stand up and say, look, I know that you could get it, but now probably not. So what they're doing is they're worried that there may be too much upward pressure on these prices too quickly. Yeah? So therefore, that's, so they're being, it's being removed. So funding for lending for next year will only be available, I believe, for corporates, not for you and I buying a house. Yeah? So they're trying to remove that pressure. But they still want corporates. I would say that the help to buy scheme doesn't have long to, doesn't have long to, it can't have. And, and again, please do not make any house buying decisions based upon what I say. <laughs> but I, it can't, I mean, it, I thought it had been the, the, one of them's been pulled, one of them's going to be pulled fairly shortly. Yeah? So therefore, they're saying we can't continue to do this. Yeah? And the, one, the help to buy. I also slightly, and again, that's because I'm middle-aged, I'm old, and all the rest of it. But what worries me is that, and again, I do also fully accept, Peter, you're old, you've got your own house, therefore you can be like this. Yeah, I accept all of those different things. But if you haven't, as an individual, if, if you don't have a deposit for your house, then if you can you actually afford to pay the mortgage for the house is the question that everybody's asking and what are interest rates at the minute really low what are interest rates going to be in two and a half years time hot a lot higher yeah so the worry you've got is you are going to stop growth in its tracks because we're going to have the sad and awful thing of repossessions yeah people not being able to afford what they're what they're doing so therefore that's the, that's the issue we've got. And I, we've got, I go to places and pe people say, oh, what do you do? I kind of talk to banks about stuff, generally the nice stuff, not the nasty stuff. And they say, oh, yeah, I've got a mortgage. If rates go up by half a percent, I am going to be stuffed. And it's a really difficult conversation. And you say, oh, is that the sun just coming out? I mean, where do, you, where do you go on that? I mean, I don't It's kind of, it's unbelievably sad. I don't know how true what they were saying was, but then they say, are, it, are rates going up? And they say, well, yes, at some point. When? I'm not, I'm not a clue. Mate. If I knew, I would be on an island somewhere with the money that I've made, having invested on that particular thing. But that's the problem you've got. Are we going to get back to the point where that's... And this is good. When we talk about unwinding QE, unwinding QE is going to push the rates up in the long end. And that's where we have our, have our problems. Okay, so, but asset prices are going up, yeah? A lot of the asset prices we've got. What about business confidence? Confident in the business world? There is lots of stuff on this. So, the Purchasing Managers Index, which we call a PMI, this is where you ask the purchasing managers in the UK, how much are you buying in relation to what you've bought in the past? If it's above 50, that means we're growing. If it's below 50, we're shrinking. Yeah? 
cool with that. Don't ask me why we picked that. But the purchasing manager index in the UK, 54%. They are full of vim and vigor. Yeah? So therefore, the, we are growing. Factory output and orders, the highest it's been for 18 years. Yeah? So that's our factory output and our orders. Highest it's been for 18 years. So therefore, the business world is feeling kind of cool about life at the minute. Yeah? Their earnings, some of them are all right, some of them are, are less positive, but they believe we are on the way up. Yeah? In the service sector, we're doing all right as well. In the UK, we need the service sector to, to kind of grow. Unemployment is on its way down. Yeah, to everybody. So therefore, unemployment's on its way down. Business confidence is on its way up. Our asset prices are kind of fine. The only thing that I think consumer confidence is suffering from is our wages are not really going anywhere. And we've still got the uncertainty of what's going on. And that's what we need. We need you and I to feel confident enough to go out there and spend. Yeah, that's because over two thirds of our growth comes from our spending. If we ain't spending, we ain't growing. Yeah. From the government side of things, by the way, public spending is down. Yeah, we're still spending a bit, but that's actually going to turn negative, relatively speaking. The government is going to start spending less than it did last year. So therefore, that's going to have a downward pull. As I mentioned, our exchange rate, we've, over the last couple of months, our exchange rate has got stronger against the euro and the US dollar. That might have a slowing effect. Most of our exports go to the eurozone, so therefore, if we become stronger against the euro, then that might have, a, have an impact. The reason our rates are getting stronger is because we've got lots of good news. They don't have as much good news. So therefore, the market thinks, if anywhere, interest rates are going to go up sooner, it's the UK. The UK is growing, is in a better, statistically, is in a better situation now than America and, in, and Europe. Yeah? The thing about interest rates, you use it, it's up to the bank. It's up to the Bank of England what they do and it's up to what they're focusing on. So some people would argue they're artificially low at the minute because we are getting growth, we are getting whatever. Uh, and they have been at this, this is, historically, this is still a low level. I mean, when you think about it, three, four percent is, is not an unusual rate of interest, right? So therefore, they are going to keep it there until the growth is solid, is their argument. So yes, they're going to do that. But the problem is what I do now has an impact on tomorrow. And if I keep this going for too long, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cause carnage in the future. And that's a problem. That they're, that. So when to unwind and how quickly to unwind is, is the key driver to, to all of this now. So we're kind of bobbling along nicely. We're growing a little bit. Inflation's looking all right. Unemployment's coming down. It's kind of a good place to be, relatively speaking, to the other developed nations. But what happens next is, the, is, is, what, is what, what we're worrying about now. And all of this, again, could collapse if, as I've said, if we have another shock in the Eurozone. They're all of that's, that, that's what we need. The Euros want to come back. We need America to get back to where it's going. But we, we've got issues. We've got issues in America. We've got issues in Europe. We've got issues here. If any of these issues raise their head, then that might be problematic. And that's the, that's the issue we've got. I was, uh, I was working for a company called Alexandra Workwear who you will all know as Europe's largest provider of overalls. It was the place to be, yeah? So I was sharing a flat with two lads. One of them worked for a chocolate company, one of them worked for a lager company, and I worked for somebody that produced work clothing. I didn't really add a lot to that particular flat's entertainment. Uh, my boss was going, and it was that morning where it was, we were coming out of the, 
the Euro Resort with there was Le Mans was having this. And I was watching, I had a little thing on the screen, and the interest rates were moving up by the second sort of thing. And they got to the, this uh, about 15%. We weren't there for long, because that generally has a negative impact on growth and all the rest of it. But the world was just worried about, about what was going on. Yeah, so they have been at that point. I wouldn't, and the, the, it's going to go to there if you are either in trouble as a nation, and people were wondering how we are going to get over the decision we'd made. We were moving out of this kind of linked system and whatever else. Uh, or you've got rampant inflation. Now, I think the former, the, what Le Monde had, that, that's not a problem, I don't think. Or not a problem. It's not as big an issue. I think the worry we've got is inflation. But the, the, the issue we do have, and we, we're going to go on to it, unwinding QE is going to put rates up can businesses and individuals service the debt that they have got? And I think we're not overly, businesses possibly, but individuals, I think we're not overly sure. And that is why some people were thinking this funding for lending, this help to buy, might cause us problems going, going forward. Yeah? Now the government will probably have to step in and then we'll say our deficit has gone up again. <laughs> But in 2030, we're going to be perfect. Yeah, so that's the, that's the issue you've got. That's the, in my humble opinion, by the way, and I'm sure there are people, if they do watch this, thinking, shut up, strange bloke from the north. But that's, that's what we've got, yeah? So I would say we're not spending, it's growing, but not growing enough. That is growing a little bit, but again, not growing enough. That, we haven't got a clue. International trade. Again, depends a lot on Eurozone and America and every ball of it, other, all of it. And again, the Chinas, the Brazils are obviously all fundamentally important. But if you look at the level of exports we've got and the level of business we do with people, it's still mainly with, with us. But China, Brazil, Russia, etc., are all absolutely massively important. So, where next? So what we're thinking about doing is tapering, unwinding, yeah, this quantitative easing. That's our first step. And what we then do is we start to take money out of the market. We stop kind of we, the, the stuff that we've bought, we then might sell. And at that point, there's going to be less liquidity in the markets. There's going to be an upward pull on rates. And there may be a downward pull on bond prices on equity prices, etc. Yeah, it's everybody, so that's a thing. So we're only going to do this if we are very happy with our growth. Yeah, everybody cool with that? So we are solid as far as growth is concerned and our unemployment is less than 7%. Yeah, so that's the only way we're going to do it. I would say, again, we would like real growth. So we'd like our growth to be above our, our, which is what the growth figures are. So I would say kind of two and a half, three percent for a sustained period. That's what we want. We want sustained. So at the minute we're going like that. But if we can get two percent sustained, we're probably going to be happy. Sustained over a few quarters, yeah, without a doubt, yes. But you're right. It's, it's whatever whatever we, we feel at that point. Okay? So, if we start to sell our assets, unwind this whole system too soon, then what are the bad things that can happen? What do you think can happen which will cause pain and heartache? So, the interest rates going up will reduce growth. Yeah? It will increase bankruptcy and insolvency and repossessions. Which will then put pressure on our banks. And we'll probably end up back in recession. If we do it too soon, then that is going to have, it's going to 
undo all of our good work, if you like, yeah? So rates go up, people can't pay their mortgages, companies can't pay their loans, bad debt in the banking system shoots up. The banking system is already under a reasonable amount of stress in a lot of the developed countries, so therefore will they be able to handle it, yeah? And we'll, our growth will drop away and will drop into recession, yeah? But he, so if we do that too soon, then that may happen. What if we leave it in there too long? What's the big worry? The big worry we have got is inflation. Yeah? Even hyperinflation people are talking about, yeah? So there will be too much money chasing too few goods and therefore prices will shoot up uncontrollably. Yeah? So we will have a lot of, so kind of people are talking about double digit inflation, I can't see that, but I didn't see 2005 happening, I didn't see 99 happening, but, but that's, the, that's what you've got. So therefore, the big problem is too late, is inflation. And again, if inflation starts to shoot up, it will have a dampening impact on the economy and on everything. So it's kind of like Goldilocks and the porridge, if you like, yeah? If we do, if it's too cold, to what we've kind of got to do it just right. And we haven't got a clue on where just right sits. Yeah? So therefore, we've got to do this thing in such a way where we avoid both of these things. Anybody who's saying get rid of it now thinks inflation is the main concern. Anybody who's saying leave it alone thinks growth is the main concern. Which of them are right? I'll tell you in 10 years' time is kind of the answer, but we don't know. Yeah, does everybody... See, so that's the fundamental thing. From a fiscal perspective, as I've said, we have to remain fairly neutral. So it's the monetary guys that are, that are trying, to, trying to drive it forward. So they, Mark Carney has said that it's probably going to be 2015 that we start messing around with these measures too much. Yeah? And what he's trying to do is he's trying to make people comfortable that they have got this cheap finance for a reasonable length of time. Yeah, is everybody cool with that? That's his message. Whether they believe it or not is a different matter. Okie doke. So, so that's us. What's happening elsewhere? The, my favorite place is the US because, bless them, they always, this is the one number that's different in the US. That's because it changed yesterday. So as far as uh, debt is concerned, I just, there was a, if you go on YouTube and you type in US debt, then there's a comedian. And if you watch it, it is one of the funny, but what he says is the debt in the UK is X billion. The debt in France is X billion. The debt in America is wah! So there's just not a number that can describe the size of the, so therefore, their debt, 16 trillion, it's up to about 17 trillion now. Their debt as part of its GDP is about the same. And again, it was around about 60% before the crash. Now, in America, inflation, they, <laughs> they're worried that it's possibly going to get too low, yeah? So therefore, we, there's less stimulation. GDP growth slowed down a little bit. They're hoping it's going to go up. Unemployment moving towards their six and a half percent thing, yeah? So America has already dipped their toe in the water as far as tapering's concerned because what they did was they said they were thinking about unwinding in the middle of this year. Does anybody know what happened in the middle of this year when Ben Bernanke announced that he might think about unwinding? The markets tanked. Everybody was so, you talk to some 70-year-old professor who is living and you say to him, uh, growth prospects are good, inflation under control, unemployment on the way down, what happened to the equity markets? He's not going to say they tanked. The reason they tanked was because Bernanke said, we may be getting close to the point where we unwind. And everybody just panicked. You can't do that. That was in the middle of 2013. Yes, that was this year. 2013 this year. <laughs> well, uh, they all blend into one. So that was in the middle of this year. So I'm really sorry about that. 
So that's what we've got. So our first attempt at mentioning and winding this thing has ended up with, did you think I said that? Well, what I actually meant was this, and we're kind of pulling it back. So we don't know with that, that's a, a bit of a problem. America puts in 85 billion a month, because <laughs> they kind of can. Uh, and one of them is, instead of buying government bonds, they buy mortgage-backed securities in the States. Yeah, as well as, so therefore they have a broader range. Again, to put money back in for the housing market. And they have this thing called the Maturity Extension Program, which obviously the markets cannot use such long words, so we change that to Operation Twist. And this 45 billion is where they issue short-term debt to buy long-term debt, yeah? And if they're buying lots of long-term debt, then, sorry, then what happens to the price of that debt? It goes down. What happens to your interest rates? So the price of that debt goes up, your interest rates come down. Yeah, it's everybody. So Operation Twist is all about keeping long-term interest rates low. They said they were going to do it, and then they said they were going to stop doing it, but they haven't. But they've got about 85 billion going into the market. When are they going to stop doing that? Again, we don't know. Janet Yellen is coming in to take over in February, I think, bless her. So therefore, she's going to have to decide when to. But I know we're kind of running out of time, I think, but this is the big thing that's coming up in America. America's system has two weird things. There's government funding and there is the debt ceiling. Both of them we had problems with last year. Can I remember the government kind of shut down, all of the parks shut. They've come up with an agreement, Democrats and Republicans, it's passed one of the houses, and they believe that that's so therefore we're not going to have parks shutting down, government organizations shutting down for the next two years, if it passes the next bit, and it probably will. But what we don't know is the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling at the minute is 16.5 trillion. We're already at 17.2 trillion. They're only doing it using special measures or whatever. There is going to be another vote on this thing. And that is the one thing that everybody on the planet thinks could derail uh, everybody's growth. If America does not sort this out, then that's a problem. Yeah? So you've got the Republicans and the Democrats, two totally different views on life. And that's kind of a, a bad thing. If they don't sort that out, then... It's carnage. And bless him, Mr. Ryan, when he was announcing this, finished his speech by saying, but the debt ceiling is another matter. Yeah? And my final point, because it's got a, a typo in there, is Australia, it's 3% and 2.2%. And all I want to show you is that we're where we are, but elsewhere in the planet, people are in a different Australia is worried about dropping into a recession. If you look at its numbers, its GDP growth is slowing, its unemployment is going up, it's cut interest rates in nine of the last 12 months in order to try and stimulate the economy. The one positive for these guys is their debt to GDP ratio is about 20%. So they're in a slightly different place. But they're worried about a recession. So Australia, a huge export of commodities, the 12th biggest country GDP-wise on the planet, is worrying about dropping into recession. The Eurozone is worrying about everything. And if you look at the Eurozone in total, it has the biggest GDP on the planet. And it's in a big, big muddle at the moment. So what we've got to do is, when we're on tapering or whatever, we've got to be aware that it's not necessarily in our own hands. Okay.